We're in series three of Genesis um, and the, the creation week, and today we're going to continue to look in Genesis chapter one. So let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you for all that you have done, and we thank you for all that you're revealing to us in this day. We just pray that you be with us today and open our hearts and our minds to your word. In Yeshua's name, amen. All right, so it's creation week. Let's see what we got. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Of course, the word there is Elohim. And we covered this verse in some detail in the last couple of weeks, right? And, and there's really a lot of interesting consequences of this verse. There's some just amazing things that go on in this verse. And uh, we're going to look at it's a little bit more of them and more of the creation process in chapter 1. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. <clears throat> We've looked at the laws of logic. Everything that has a beginning has a cause, right? <clears throat> and so, does the universe have a beginning? You know, originally people didn't think it did. I mean, years ago they thought it actually had been here forever. It was one of the constants. Well, it turns out it does have a beginning. Let's take a look at that. The first law of thermodynamics states that the total amount of mass, energy, in the universe is constant. I know you think this is a science class, the Bible class. Okay, brace yourself. We looked last week at E equals mc squared. Energy and mass, E energy equals mass times b to the squared. So those two, that, that's just a thing, okay? And that total amount of energy and mass, nothing is going into a sub-universe or anything. It's all here. It moves around, right? But it's all here. So this is one of this is the first law of thermodynamics. Nobody's adding mass or adding energy to this system we call the universe. Okay, it's constant. The second law is that the amount of energy that's in the universe is actually running down. Okay, uh, things are cooling off. It's running down, and it's a process called entropy, and it basically means the universe is winding down. Things are slowing down. Energy is going from this higher form to a lower form. That's all it means. It's winding down. Both of those are testable, both of those are measurable, and they, these are not theories, these are facts. Okay, so physics, modern physics is based on this. We understand that. So it's the fact that the universe is, had a, it had a beginning. We know it had a beginning because it's running down. It couldn't have, you know, if it was just constant, then we would say, well, maybe it's just always been here. But something that's running down, if you see a car slowing down, you say, you know what, that thing was going faster somewhere back down the road, you know, because it's winding down. Right? You know, it was running. As my scooter goes to a stop, I'm thinking, it was running, but now it's not running. <laughs> okay? So what has all this got to do with God? Okay? Well, it's a very interesting thing. This has everything to do with Him because, first of all, we see that the universe had a beginning. Therefore, it had a sufficient cause. Okay? What about God? Does he have a beginning? The laws of logic state that everything which has a beginning has a sufficient cause. God exists outside of time. He existed before time. He is the creator of time. Remember that it's only... Because people will ask you this, well, if God created the universe, who created God? How would you answer that question? Here's the answer. The answer is only things that have a beginning need a sufficient cause. Okay? Creation had a cause in order to exist. It's interesting that Yahweh's name is, basically means I am. He, I just am. There's no time involved in that. There's no beginning, there's no end. I just am. Okay? His name means that. He, ex he exists. And so there's no beginning or end. He is the creator of time itself. So he can't possibly have a beginning in something that he created. That makes sense? Time is something he created. He couldn't have started in time because he created it. There's no time. And, and this is not weird stuff. This is actually physics. Before the universe began, there was no time. And so the real question is, did he have a beginning? And the answer is, there is no time for the creator of time since he exists outside of time, independent of time. He has no beginning in time. He is the cause 
of time, space, and matter. And that's what Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We looked at that in, in some more detail last week, but I just want to get this in your head. Some of you missed it, some of you were in the back, so I want to make sure everybody get it. So, remember I said everything needs a, a cause, a first cause. Things. He is the first cause of time and the universe, and therefore he doesn't need a cause. If you're the first cause, you don't need a cause. Think about it. If you're the second cause, you need, you, need, you need a cause. If you're the first cause, like you existed and you started things, you don't need a cause. Because you began before time began. And so, given those facts of physics, the question of who created God is no longer a logical question. It becomes an illogical question because it's outside of time, it's before time, it's independent of time. So he doesn't need a creator. Okay? That makes sense? You got that? All right, put your books away. We got a blank piece of paper. We're going to have a test. No, we're not. Okay. Somebody's going to ask you that one day, I guarantee you. And so what happened? The next verse says, And the earth was without form and void, in some translations, or empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. That's very interesting, that, that phrase there, the deep. Okay, interesting phrase, we're going to look at it. It says the earth, and the earth was without form and, em and empty. Okay, so the, the planet existed, but it's without form. It's like, it, it's in an unformed state. It's, it's really only a mass of matter, chaos, okay? Um, it's not, it, er everything is there, but it's not in a usable, life-sustaining state, okay? Okay. Um, it has all the elements for life to exist. The laws of physics are in place. But it's a dark mass, raging seas of chaos. That word there, the deep, on the face of the deep, is actually a different word than waters. Mayan, which is a standard word for waters. This is an interesting word here. It's tehom. And it comes from the Hebrew word home, which means to roar, to rage. And it means like raging water. So it's just like, it's chaos. I like looking at it. It's chaos. Okay, it's just, it's unformed, okay? But in the midst of that unformed, that dark mass, that raging sea of chaos, you get this really cool picture. The Spirit of God moved. And you look at that word, it's like hovered, covered over the face of the chaos. Okay, so he's there, covering over. It's like, now this is interesting. Um, we're going to look at a Kyle and DeLeach, um, great historic commentators, Use this book by Henry Wald, A Grammar of the Hebrew Language of the Old Testament. And so, very interesting guy. I was thinking about how the world today, we honor people who, and we're going to talk about it in a second, who are just, you know, Hollywood types. They don't actually do anything. They just, you know, oh, I can act like somebody else. Look at, look at the titles under this guy's name. This is a guy who spent his entire life focusing on language. What does it mean, ancient languages? What is a Hebrew language? That's actually one of the last languages he did. And he taught languages. Professor of Oriental liter Literature at the University of Göttingen. He's a member of the Royal Society of the Same, the Royal Asiatic Society of Paris, of the Imperial Academy of Sciences of Petersburg, of the Historic Theological Society of L Leipzig. Thank you. And I love this. This is on the front of his book. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It just keeps going. You know, like... It's like, I, it's just, we're running out of paper, and here, let's quit wasting. It's just, you know, he knows what he's talking about. He's, um, he, he wrote this book in around uh, 1836. Um, it, it's quite a scholarly work. I, I love looking at it just, you know, just like, wow, it is just awesome that somebody would dedicate and focus. You just don't see that so often today, you know. I mean, I'm sure they're out there, they're in a room somewhere, you know, but... It's really cool that there were so many people dedicated to Scripture in the 1800s and finding out what, it, what does it really mean. But what's interesting about that is we get people today, we get Hebrews who are kind of new to this walk, and, and they'll look on the East Sword and just kind of come up with their own translations of what the Bible means, you know. <laughs> really? <laughs> it's like, let's go with what this guy says. Okay. So Kyle and DeLeach took this, Translation, using his rules of grammar, and translated this, or we didn't really translate it, he just said, this is what it means, that phrase. It said, the chaotic mass in which the earth and the firmament were still 
undistinguished, unformed, and as it were, unborn, was a heaving deep, an abyss of waters. And that's where they're using this particular word in the, in the rules of what it says. And the comment there, that's the word in Greek, how it was translated in the Septuagint. That's the LXX, 250 BC. And this deep was wrapped in darkness. But it was in process of formation. For the Spirit of God moved on the waters. Okay, So... This was interesting to me. When you look at this, you look at that phrase and what's going on here in the physical, think about what goes on with us spiritual. It's really a good way to like, how's he working in my life, right? We know that we are in process, right? We are being formed. We are being created spiritually. But sometimes in that process, we get caught up in motions and we get caught up in things and we, we, we actually become this swirling mass of chaos. I know I do. I mean, I just, I definitely do. I got caught up in something the other day and I was backed away from it. Like, it's unbelievable. I can't believe I got caught up in it, you know. Like emotions and frustration and, and I'm like, what in the world was that, you know. And, and, and we get in a state where we're unformed and certainly not in Yahweh's purpose. I certainly wasn't that day. I was very angry with this guy who, it was irrelevant what he was doing. It's like when somebody cuts you off in traffic. But the Spirit of God, that's the key, but the Spirit of God moves. And when He moves over our lives, out of the chaos that we've got caught up in, things start to calm down. And order, His order, starts to take over the chaos. I've been there a lot of times. I don't know about you guys. I've been there a lot of times. But you know, praise Yah that He's there. He keeps going. It says, the Ruach Elohim here in, in this phrase, the Spirit of God, Okay. is not a breath of wind caused by God. Okay. He mentions um, Theodore. He's a 5th century theologian, school of Antioch. In other words, he's just, he said he uses it this way too. So they, they're analyzing this verse. That's what I want you to see. So this is not just something caused by God. It says, for the verb does not suit that meaning, but it is the creative spirit of God. Okay. It's the principle of all life. Let me give you some quotes there where you can find that. So the Spirit of God is, th is this um, creative Spirit of God. It's active in creation. Okay? Principle of all life. The Spirit of God. Which worked upon the formless, lifeless mass, separating, quickening, and preparing the living forms which were called into being by the creative works that followed. Okay? So it's his spirit that gives us life. You think about it. So this darkness of mass that's lifeless, but it's being formed by the power, by the spirit of God, the Ruach of Elohim, okay, who's hovering over it, covering it like a bird with her nest. Deuteronomy 32 uses this phrase, literally describe an eagle hovering over a nest. So, you know, God, the spirit of God is like, come on, come on, we can do this, you know, just bringing it together, bringing, bringing calm to the chaos, okay? And so it's protecting that yet unformed mass. And I'm thinking, how many times has he protected me when I'm this yet unformed mass that's just kind of going crazy and heaving and burbling and whatever, you know, the raging waters. But yet, he, he's kept it contained. I've got a purpose for this. We're going to make something out of this. I know it's out of control right now, but we're going to bring it into control. And so I just see a really cool spiritual aspect to this. And so he's protecting us, covering us as we're in this process. You know, as this word that follows the words of Yahweh that speaks to him. If you think about it, life is something that is imparted. It's not actually created. So when, when he comes to Adam, he breathed in him the breath, the ruach of life. So life itself comes from God, right? It's not, he didn't go, poof, there is life. He imparts life. And so that's what he's doing. Forming, order, giving it life. That's what he does to us. That's what he does to us. And so the chaos turns into life. Okay? Um, he also protects us during this process. That's what that picture is. He guides us. We're, until we get to our final purpose. Of course, he keeps guiding us. Of course, when we get to our final purpose, he guides that as well. But unlike the unfinished earth that we're looking at here, 
we have a choice. The earth has no choice. He's like, do this, do this, do this. Let there be, let there be, let there be. And he's calling it in being. We can submit to our purpose that we were created for and find shalom. That's where peace is, when we find our purpose. Okay? Real peace is, is when we find our purpose. When our passion meets our purpose, you find shalom. You really find shalom and meaning in life. But we can rebel against it too because we always have freedom of choice, right? We can look at the world, I want to do this, I want to do this, and we make it about us, okay, instead of about... Anytime we make things about us, it doesn't work out well. It just doesn't because we're not about us. He didn't create us to be about us. He created us to be about him, about life, about all these things, you know. We're not supposed to be in our own self. And when we submit to his ways and his purpose for our lives... We become his children, right? Word says that. We become his children, and that's where we find joy. You want to find joy? Find your purpose, okay? Your passion and your purpose meet. There's joy. There's peace. The Word says that. For those who are led by the Spirit of God, the Ruach Elohim, okay, are the children of God. So it's not just a breath. It's not just a wind from God. It's his Spirit, literally his Spirit. And when we're led by that, that's when we become his children, once, think about it, once the earth was formed into life by the Spirit of Yah, okay, it began to produce life and blessings. And so once our lives are formed and ordered by His Spirit, it too will bear fruit once we submit to that Spirit, to that purpose. Romans 15, Paul's like, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him. Because we don't trust him. If we go off and go, I'm going to do it my way. I'm not worried about Yah's way. I'm going to do it my way. This is what. That, it just doesn't work. Even if it works in the physical, there's no peace in it because you know you rebelled against God. You know what I mean? You, it still doesn't work. Okay? Even if you get away with it, it doesn't work. Okay? It's not where peace is. And so, but once we just submit to that, we will bear fruit. And here it is. The fruit of the Spirit, see, this is from Genesis to Galatians to we're all the way through the Scripture. This foundational, that's what's so cool about creation. It's like kindergarten. Everything you needed to know, you learned the first, first year of school, you know, before it was even really school. Don't hit him, you know, stay in your seat, you know, you could go on. Don't steal, don't, you know. It's just simple stuff. It's right here. And the fruit of the Spirit is, and so if we don't have love, Joy, peace, patience. This is the stuff the world's complaining about. Okay? They don't have love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faith and gentleness and self-control. That's like, write a book about how to get that and you make money. Okay? But we actually have a book about how to get that. It's just people aren't willing to read it. Okay? Because they want it to be, they want life to be about them. So we ask the creator in Psalm 51, create in me. He's a creator, right? So he can do this. Create in me, his spirit, a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit. So that means we can have a wrong spirit, right? That's not his spirit. Okay. We definitely can have that. Okay. And so we pray, our prayer is that like, create in us a clean heart and re, you know, renew a right spirit within me. But in order for that to happen, we have to be a willing vessel, don't we? Yeah, he's not going to force you. Okay. But if we are, it will produce abundant fruit for the kingdom. It really will. And, it, and we will be in shalom and joy. Amen? Yes. Amen. Interesting phrase here in chapter 1. In verse 3 it says, God says, let there be light. And there was light. Alright? That sounds really simple. It's like God says, let there be light. He said, let there be, the, you, know, you know, everything. He said, let there be light. And there's light. Okay. Only there's a problem. This is day one. The sun isn't created until day four. And so... People look at this like, well, the Bible can't possibly be true because he's got light coming up here, you know, and sun doesn't even exist until day four, right? 
And this is where it really starts to get interesting. You just thought it was interesting. It starts to get interesting here. So let's take a look at it. Let's see what we got. So here's the question you get. How can there possibly be light when there's no sun? It's like evening, morning, the first day. How is that? Even, you don't even have a sun. You know, can't even possibly have it. Well, okay, this is what's interesting. Do you know what light is? Light's a very interesting thing. Light is created when atoms... Okay, all kinds of atoms, by the way, um, release previously absorbed energy. It's what we call an excited atom. Atoms get really excited when they absorb energy. They're like, oh, pew. okay. <laughs> they can't hold it. They like, just get so excited they can't hold back. It's like just having a supercharged spirit. And when you go, okay, it's called a photon, and you give off this extra energy, and you can see it. It's light. So, um, and I'll give you an example. Uh, a welder, you've seen pictures of welders, or you've seen a welder, you stick that stick, you know, that rod to a piece of steel, and you got 150, 200 amps flowing through there. Electrical energy, okay, your little meter is spinning like crazy. It's hot, you're wearing gloves because you got molten steel, right? So there's a lot of energy there, but what do we see? Because as it's going in, the air's being heated up around it, tremendous amount of heat. The steel's turning hot. Actually, it's molten steel. You're melting the steel at the end of the rod, and you're melting the rod away. We call it burning it, but you're really melting it. That process, think about it. You're putting all this energy into it that's now being, it goes in as energy, electrical energy, as an arc, and then it's cooling. Metal's flowing, and so it, these atoms that have been highly energized are cooling down. How do they do that? They release photons. They got highly charged, and now it's in the process. So actually, light comes from that process of it, you know, releasing that energy that's been put into it. Okay? So if you think about it, everything from explosions to lightning to um, a fluorescent bulb. We've got fluorescence up here. Um, we've got fluorescence along the wall. There's some incandescence over here. Who knows what's in that thing? <laughs> but it gets really hot. So it's probably a halogen bulb, and, which is a gas that gets, you know, it's in a gas, a piece of metal in a gas. They all work the same way. They, they release energy from excited atoms. Now, here's another one. How about fireflies? Fireflies mix these luminescent chemicals which excite the atoms in the chemicals. One chemical excites the, okay? I mean, God knows a little bit about light. He made those bugs, right? Okay. And so it releases the energy of the, uh, you know, you get chemical reactions, and that releases the energy. You get the excitement, it releases the energy, and there it goes. So how does God fit into this equation? And it's really pretty simple. We see that he makes things. Interesting verse here. The Bible says in the book of John, 1 John actually, it says that God is light. Now, we would look at that and go, well, that's a metaphor, right? It's a metaphor. Here's the whole verse. It says, this is the message which we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light. And in him there's no darkness at all. Okay, that's, that's a metaphor. I mean, light's good, darkness bad, there's no bad in God. So, yeah, okay, buy that. goes on. In John 8, 12... Yeshua speaking, he says, Again, therefore, Yeshua spoke to them and said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So again, it's kind of a metaphor there of, of physical light and spiritual light. Um, they're, they're definitely spiritual, but the question is, you know what we found over the years? is If, if something's spiritual, look for the physical. Look for it. And that would be the normal case, so let's look and see if it's possible here. In a book of Revelation chapter 21, this is what it says about the new Jerusalem. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb were the temple. They are the temple. And the city has no need for a sun. It doesn't need a moon. For the very glory of God illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. Hmm? There will be no night, and there's no need for a lamp light, for the Lord God will illuminate them, and they will reign forever and ever. 
That sounds physical to me, you don't know? <laughs> okay, so is this a metaphor or a physical reality? It seems more like a physical reality at this point. So let's look a little further. If you remember back in Exodus, when Israel is leaving Egypt, right? Uh, before they left Egypt, sorry. This is during the plagues, the plague of darkness. Okay, the plague of darkness is said they, you know, it got really thick, you know, it was dark for three days and said they didn't see one another. Nobody rose from their place for three days. I mean, three whole days, like there's no light. It's just dark, 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 dark. But the children of Israel had light in all their dwellings. Okay. How about once they're traveling? Exodus 13, Yahweh went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them on their way, and at night by a pillar of fire to give them light. That they might, why don't they need a sun? Because they've got Yahweh. They don't need the sun. He is the sun. He, he is the fire. He's the consuming fire. He's all that, okay? So this is clearly physical, but I love the spiritual implication here that Israel dwells in light. Amen? Yeah, and so Israel dwells in light. The whole purpose is Israel should be dwelling in light, physical and spiritual, I might add. And I have a lot of business hanging around in the darkness because you yeah, need to be in the light. Paul, speaking here in Acts chapter 22, has an interesting day. He's going down the Damascus Road, minding his own business, or he really isn't minding his own business, but he probably thinks he is. He's minding Yahweh's business. Yeshua's about to get in his business. And about noontime, you know, it's bright. It's, he's, he's in Israel. It's hot at noontime. It's bright, okay? Suddenly, a great light. Okay, this is the middle of the day. And something that's like way overwhelming. This great light shines around him. And he finds himself on the ground. Now, if it's the middle of the day in Israel, if, if, I mean, it's like being out. Just, we're at the same parallel here. So it, you're out in the middle of a field or on some rocky road and in the middle of a, of a day. It's intensely hot, and light hits you so hard that it knocks you to the ground. That's some pretty intense light. Sun's already doing everything it can do, right? So there's a source of light here that's beyond the power of the sun. So now I, suddenly a great light shined around me from, uh, from the sky, and I fell to the ground, and I hear this voice saying, Shaul, Shaul, why are you persecuting me? He said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Yeshua of Nazareth, whom you persecute. And it, and it goes on. This is interesting. It said, those who were with me, oh, they indeed, they, I like that word, they ended. Oh, they definitely saw the light. <laughs> okay? And they were afraid. So this is not some wimpy little, oh, yes, I think I saw something. This knocked him to the ground. The people saw it, and they're, they're scared, the people with him. These are soldiers, okay? These are guys that, you know, they're on a mission. These aren't just some theologians here. These guys are on a mission, Okay? But they didn't understand the voice. It, it, it doesn't say they didn't hear it. That's interesting too. It says they didn't understand the voice of him who spoke to me. Isn't it interesting how the Lord can speak and not everybody can understand it? Unless our hearts and our minds are prepared to hear his word, we might hear it, but I don't know what that was. And it can be pretty loud. And we, I don't know what that was. So there's a lot of ways that, that God can create light. He doesn't clearly, doesn't need the sun. I love this one here because this is the middle of the day and they just thought they had some light until it was so bright it knocks him off, you know, knocks him on the ground. Um, it would seem that actually the opposite would be the problem because in the Hebraic thought and the language in verse 3, it's talking about light itself. He said, let there be light. Okay. It's not talking about the source. It's talking about light itself. Let there be light. The, this energy. Okay? This light itself. Not the source of the light. And then there's a different word there uh, where it talks about when it starts talking about the sun itself. It's, it talks about the luminaries. is a good translation for it. Which are the source when the sun and the moon when they're created. But in this verse it's not talking about the source of light. It's just let there be light. Okay? I had a very interesting thing happen the other day. It was full moon. Look up in the sky and uh, I was like, what? Look at this. And so we're outside. Man, is that a shin? And like a second later, like, oh my goodness. That is an untouched picture off my phone sent to my computer, sent to you. 
And as I'm looking at this shin, I'm going, oh my goodness. And I zoomed out. I don't know if you noticed. I, that was one click, and it's like uh, 30 seconds later, I clicked again in a slightly different angle. Look at the name on the boat in the bottom of the picture. Emmanuel, God with us. I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. <laughs> I was like, the first one, I had just a slightly different angle. I didn't catch it. I didn't even notice the boat sitting there. We were like looking over a dock. And it's like, and it's the only boat sitting there. You can see there's some boats way in the background. There's across the bay. But I'm like, wow, that is so cool. So God does some cool stuff. It's all his stuff. Here's a really cool one. Um, the Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis, um, is a classic example of light coming from excited atoms. That's exactly what it is. Um, God has absolutely no problem creating light without the sun. I mean, this is a non-issue. Okay? I, I've, I've been up in the north in and, and Alaska and stuff, and it's just the first time I saw it was on this boat, and I'm up there, and I'm waking people up. Like, come out. You've got to see this. You see. What is it? I forget what latitude we're at, but we're up there. Okay? And I said, the northern lights. Lord, like, go to bed, PJ. It's like, they see this stuff all the time. I'm like freaking out. It actually was, it looked about like that. And I'm like, no, you've got to see this, and I'm trying to take pictures of it and figure out. By the way, if you ever want to do it, 400 exposure and about four seconds on a tripod, and you can catch it. And so God has absolutely no problem with this. He can create light. The, light is an interesting thing. Light is a, they struggle with is light a wave, like a, a wave, like electricity, or is it a particle? And the answer is yes. And physicists don't like that. Because they put things either in, this is a wave, and this is a particle, and there's light, and we don't even know what to do with that. Because it kind of just defies all their logic and principles, okay? And this is part of it. So when you get, you know, it's, it's like God just kind of, I'm playing. This is my stuff. I'm gonna, I'll make light, you know, make it pretty. You know, it, it didn't even have to be pretty. And it's in all different colors, just depending on what kind of gases are being, it's being exposed to and what levels of the atmosphere. The blue ones are really low. The green ones are, are pretty high up. The red ones are even higher. So now, I have a question for you. Question again. God is light. Is that a metaphor? Or is that physical truth? And you know what the answer is. I know you know what the answer is, right? Yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. And remember that God spoke into existence, into existence every atom in the universe. Okay? He is the E in E equals MC squared. Do you suppose that the atoms in God's creation would get excited in the presence of their almighty creator who created them? Okay? And so, yeah. So God is light? Well, of course, you know, because it, it just the energy, think about it, the energy he would give off would just, would create light, similar to the Aurora Borealis, it can do that. I like talking about Stephen Hawking just because he's fun to talk about, okay? So he struggled um, in the last years of his life. He was working on something called a theory of everything, um, the theory of everything, and this is a definition. It says an all-encompassing, coherent, theoretical framework of physics that fully explains and links together all physical aspects of the universe. Okay? So, the reality is he stared in the face of the answer to that and how everything in physics works. He literally looked at the answer and ignored it because the true answer involves God. And the reality is that the theory of everything will never be found by an atheist. It's not possible. Because they refuse to look at the most likely and just refuse to look at, even consider, the most likely and obvious answer. And he briefly came up with a theory right before he died, but then he finally just like, no, scratch that. I know it doesn't work. He was just scrambling because he knew he was near death. And he died really still looking for the answer. And because... An atheist will never find the answer, and he was an atheist. Okay. The theories that he's trying to link is the general theory of relativity of Einstein and the newer quantum field theory, where we look at other aspects. I won't go into all that. 
quantum physics is interesting. There's another theory that's not really a theory, and it's G equals E. And here's the way that one works. God equals everything, okay? He created time, he created mass, and he created light. In fact, John 1, 3 says, all things were made through Yeshua. Without him, not anything was made that's been made. So how can you leave the creator of time and mass and energy out of an equation and think you're going to come up with the answer? You can't. It's not possible. You're not doing science anymore when you start automatically excluding things just because you don't like it. Okay? It didn't say you have to like it. It just, it is. Colossians 1.16, For by him all things were created in heaven and in earth, the visible, the invisible, where the thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. Okay, we're right back to he doesn't need a creator because he's before all that. And in him all things hold together. So he holds his word, let there be, that word, that power, that authority holds it together. Theory of everything? There it is. God is the source of everything. That's why people who aren't believers are going to just struggle with that forever and ever until they recognize that simple thing, God is the answer. Amen? Amen. This is interesting. He talks about light when he's creating light. He says light is good. It's a good thing. Okay? And there's physical and spiritual good. Uh, fierce, uh, that was easy for me to say. Let me see if I can do it again. <clears throat> There's physical and spiritual light, okay? And both of them are good. In Genesis 1 4, it says, God saw the light was good. And God separated light from darkness. So this is really interesting. Now that we see that there's light and dark in the world, in the physical, how about spiritually? Is it not the same way? Does He not distinguish between the two? Does God call the light day and the darkness he called night? And there was evening, there was morning, order, okay, the first day. So, you know, there's a lot here. This is just the first day. Light is good. Darkness is what you separate from good. You know what the first thing God ever called good was? Light, okay? And he separates it from darkness, and he named it light and darkness. They're not the same. He wasn't afraid to call things what they are. Light is light. Darkness is darkness, okay? No political correctness here. He simply speaks truth, right? We live in a day where men no longer speak truth. They really don't. Um, many of them don't even recognize truth anymore. They call darkness good. They call light evil. Okay? The Bible speaks to that. Isaiah 5 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You know, I'm, I'm going to get out of science. I'm going to start preaching here in a minute. The world is equating all religions as though they're just one thing. It's just philosophy. It's just all one thing. And really, once they do that, one of the, one of the goals is so they can just reject it all. Just put them all the same, throw them all out, okay? But in reality, they actually have intentionally or unintentionally started elevating one particular religion above the other, others by affording it rights that it's never afforded to religions before. There's a court in Europe, it's called the European Court of Human Rights. Its jurisdiction, it has 47 member states and its jurisdiction has been recognized and accepted in all 47 member states. It recently ruled, and I mean like recently, that insulting the Islamic prophet Muhammad, quote, goes beyond, listen to this, this is what they wrote, goes beyond the permissible limits of objective debate. Okay? So what's this all about? There's an Austrian woman who had appealed a conviction where she had called Muhammad a pedophile due to his marriage of a six-year-old girl. And she was saying, like, look, this is violating my freedom of speech. I should be able to say, so there's, there's an Islamic tradition that uh, when Muhammad was around uh, uh, late, near 50, he married a six-year-old girl. Their tradition is that he consummated that marriage when she was nine years old. And this woman wanted to just address that issue, okay? And they said, no, you can't do that. And they actually find her. The Austrian court find her. She appeals it to this uh, 
broad European court representing 47 nations, and they said, no, you don't have freedom of speech to you know, insult the Prophet Muhammad. Okay? That's very interesting. She doesn't have the right, according to this court, to give her opinion on that marriage even though it would not be legal in the very country where she said it in Austria, okay, they're the ones who convicted her of committing a crime by speaking to something that is actually a crime in the country where she said it. She said, no, you can't even say that. Okay? Um, I'm wondering how long it's going to be before that same court's going to rule that Christians no longer have the right to speak truth about the Bible. Or should we just hold our breath until that court rules that if you insult Jesus, that that's a crime? I have a feeling it's not going to happen. Okay? And so, yeah, we have good luck with that one. Hold our breath a long time, huh? Um, there's, I, I just want to show you, because the Bible talks about a time when people call good evil and evil good. Look at this one. This is the Alberta School Division. All of this is very recent. Alberta School Division bans offensive Bible verses. The Battle River School Division, a school division in western province of Alberta, Canada, ordered... Now, who do you suppose this is going to be, right? This is going to be like the National Public School. No. The Cornerstone Christian Academy to refrain from reading or studying any scripture that could be not did, that even could be considered offensive to particular individuals. This isn't a Christian school. You can't read the Bible, for goodness sake. Seriously. <laughs> There's a Christian evangelist, actually, in, in Europe, accused of a hate crime, and he's locked up after reading the Bible to a gay teenager. The pastor was charged by police, a homosexual, who asked him... Ask him, pastor, tell me, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? And he just read, it actually goes on, the whole story says he didn't use any abusive language. He didn't say anything you know, derogatory. He simply said that Adam and Eve were a man, a male and a female, in order that they could produce children. That's what the guy said this to this 19-year-old who had asked him what God's view on homosexuality was. It says, within minutes, he was taken into a police van and accused of threatening or abusive behavior, aggravated by prejudice relating to sexual orientation. That's in the UK. Um, that was last year. That one happened. He ultimately, after he was in jail for a while, he ultimately did get out. The world actually worships darkness. The world is starting to worship darkness, not God. A California philanthropy donated over a half a million dollars. You remember the masterpiece cake shop thing where he refused to make the cake for the gay wedding and it became this big deal and ultimately it was thrown out by the Supreme Court. Since that happened, and as soon as it happened, there's a, a, an organization in California that's given over a half a million dollars to projects to a specifically attack that shop. Okay, this is, the, this is it. In 2017, from 2017 and 2018, the Evelyn and Water Haas Jr. Fund, a progressive entity, <laughs> headquarters in San Francisco, okay, <laughs> has given more than half a million dollars to grants for projects opposed to the owner of the, of the um, cake shop. Okay, the Masterpiece Cake Shop, Jack Phillips. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court actually ruled ultimately in Phillips' favor, but not really based on the merits of the case, but on how the state had mishandled the case. And they stated, quote, when, Colo when the Colorado Civil Rights Commission considered this case, it did not do so with the religious neutrality that the Constitution requires, Justice Kennedy wrote. Okay. And of course, there were two liberal justices that dissented, but as soon as, as soon as, and this group was already after him, and as soon as that legal decision was made, 
Quote, Phillips found himself again in legal trouble when a Colorado lawyer filed a complaint against him for refusing to make a gender transition themed cake. Okay, and he, once again he decided um, that he believed in, in, in scripture and that God creates males and females. Okay, and that in the genetics of the body and, and the DNA of the body and what it says. And so uh, that's the Christian Post um, a month ago. Actually, it's not even a month ago. It's this month, 10, 26, 18. And so this particular case where he's, and he's just like, <laughs> how did I get to be the center point of all this? You know, it's just like somebody else. <laughs> okay. But this case is making its way through the courts. What does the word say about that? Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes that drink. I, thought, I just threw this verse in there because think about this. A lot of the, you know, the Hollywood types and, the, and all that the world is worshiping, what do they actually do? And I go back to the scholar who wrote the book on the Hebrew language of the Old Testament. That guy did something. He worked his butt off for years to get to a point to do that. Uh, what do you do for, oh, um, I can hold a glass. Think about it. Guys that party all the time, and just, you know, their profession is to hold a glass. Valiant men drinking, mixing strong drinks, you know. What happened when the, the days when we honored great men of courage, great men of scholarship? And today the world worship those who goes against the word of God. Those who are wise in their own sight, who call darkness light and light darkness. God hasn't changed. We should never elevate our own opinions against God's word because it will never work. It will never work. That's not where blessings are. Psalm 91:19. Tell us, don't stress out about this. We know what's going on in the world. It's supposed to be this way. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. Don't freak out about it. Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Yahweh your God will be with you wherever you go. We're not in this battle by ourselves. Okay, we're not. He saw the light was good, and he divides between light and darkness. We're not supposed to be participating in darkness, okay? We're supposed to be walking in the light. And not forget, Job 12, in his hand is the, light of every, is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. He holds us. He holds life. He holds the breath of all mankind. I don't care who they think they are. He's still in charge. Remember this, Isaiah 46. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am Elohim, and there's no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I declare the end from the beginning, and from the ancient times, the things that's not yet done, saying, My counsel will stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. Okay? Don't be dismayed by the noise. Don't be disturbed by the clamor. Don't be discouraged by the lies of the enemy. Their day will come. And so will the day of truth. The enemy always makes a lot of noise. And that's why I just wanted to share you that. That's like noise, noise, noise. You go, oh no, man. Okay. He always makes a lot of noise. He tries to make it look worse than it really is. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, it's time to cut your cable and read your Bible. You know, that's sort of good news. Yeah. This is an interesting study. Just to encourage you. This is this year. It's called The Hidden Tribes of America, A Study of the American Electorate. Eight percent. This is a noisy eight percent. Eight percent of Americans are in the extreme left camp. Six percent of Americans are in the extreme right camp. And those two groups hate each other. The far left's 8% of the population are progressive activists who are deeply concerned with equity and fairness as long as it's their definition of equity and fairness. They tend to be more secular, you think, 
cosmopolitan, and highly engaged with social media. So when you go on social media, who are you going to find? There they are. You're going to find this 8% who's rattling the cage of the whole world, making it seem, seem like it's, it's only 8% of the population. Okay. The far right 6% are devoted conservatives who feel that America is embattled and they perceive themselves as the last defenders of traditional values. Are they noisy? No. They're actually not. The noise is coming from the 8%. Okay? But together, the extremists only make up 14% of the American electric, electorate. Maybe they're elect, they need to be electric, okay? So God is still in charge of our lives. The vast 67, the vast majority of the people in America are not extreme. They're not this highly politicized, polarized. They're just the people stuck in the middle of this battlefield between these other two extreme groups. Okay? The majority, the overwhelming majority, two thirds of us, identify as the exhausted majority. <laughs> so I want to encourage you don't lose hope, instead, vote. Okay? God's still in charge of our lives if we will let Him be. Okay, so we, should we get caught up in the noise? Nah. It's just the way the enemy occupies your time, your energy, and your resources. Don't fall for it. Don't lose hope. It is supposed to look that way. The Bible said it would look that way. He said it was going to happen. Okay? We saw those verses in Isaiah. He said this is going to happen. He revealed this from the beginning. It's going to happen. But what does he do? Remember from the beginning, light is good, and he separates it from darkness. We're not supposed to be part of that. We're not supposed to mix with darkness. It's okay that the world is divided because light and dark don't mix. They're supposed to be separated. Okay? Just make sure we don't get caught up in the drama. That's all. And we're supposed to stand, we're supposed to take a stand for truth. Ephesians 6, Paul said, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, there's a bunch of noise out there, okay, that you may be able to withstand the evil day. And then when, I've been done, when you have done all, stand there for what you believe. Stand for truth. Amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you that in a day of craziness and chaos and a world full of drama and social media, that you've only asked us to do one thing. Just stand firm. Put on the armor of God and stand in truth, stand in light. And so I pray that for everyone here, Father, that you would encourage their hearts and minds, knowing that the enemy is running around like a roaring lion. He's not one. He's just acting like one. Makes a lot of noise. Okay? and the drama, but it's really a very small percent of the population. Very small percent. But they do affect the world. But we're not going to get caught up in it because we're called to be light. We're called to be the bearers of light and bring your message of good news and hope to a lost and dying world. So Father, I pray that you empower us and encourage us to do that today. In Yeshua's name we pray. Thank you, Father. Amen and amen. I love their Aurora Borealis. I, I don't know how many rolls of film I burned up trying to take pictures of that stuff. And they're all on slides somewhere. It's like, and you know, all the kids are going, what's the slide? The thing you go down, right? And of course, unfortunately, the slides deteriorate with age. I know. Even unless you keep them in really, really unbelievably sterile environments and never touch them. Thank you, Nick. Yay! 
Why do you think we pay this guy so much? <laughs> Thank you, Nick, for... <laughs>